Hey y'all, I'm a bit burned out on my Taka Wasm runtime, so I'm just gonna do some language comparison again today, like the good old days. And I'm gonna look at checked and unchecked exceptions and error values and panics. Let's start here in Java. I'm simulating requesting some kind of document, in this case, just very small words, and I'm pretending that those might not be found in my fake HTTP request. And I'm explicitly modeling that such an error might occur. And if I'm really relying on an external service, it might be hard to know in advance if a request will work or not. So it makes sense to make that kind of error state explicit. It's something out of my control. And this not found exception, I've defined it down here. It's not a runtime exception nor an error. So I have to declare if I want to throw it in Java. Then meanwhile, after I've retrieved it, I'm going to just sloppily turn it into a list of code points, reverse it in place, and then turn it back into a string. And this just represents arbitrary processing you might want to do on documents that you receive in whatever kind of server process you have going on. But I haven't declared any exceptions here, so I silently throw a runtime exception wrapping that one. We'll see a little bit more why later, but it's also for the sake of showing variety on things. And there's also just other hidden exceptions, such as, for example, is my list indexing okay or not? We'll get to that too. Up in main, I just call a separate run to prove whether or not we're still running after the run function finishes. And here are my simulated requests where I've mapped each to the processed text, which is reversed by code points in the text, and then I print it out. Let's run it. And tar backward is rat, flow backward is wolf, and we are still alive up here in main. Now, this is an example of where I'm using some helper code, in this case, map to obj, that takes a function, but that function is not allowed to throw an exception. We see here, r apply, no exception declared. And if I try doing that here, throws, not found exception, we get the error saying that that's not allowed. So one of the reasons I might not declare an exception is because I have to use this function call inside of something else that's not allowed to throw that exception type. And while this is very simple here, you might have a much larger code base that you're working in that has arbitrary constraints like this inside of it. Now, meanwhile, we've only made good requests so far. Let's make a bad request. Let's go one too far and run it. We see that we've caught this exception here, printed out the exception information, and then continued on. So in a sense, we had something unspecified happen, but I chose that it's okay to arbitrarily recover at this point. I usually think it's okay to recover at the top of your control loop, whatever that is. For command line applications, often that means crash out of the entire program. In a GUI application, it might be your event loop, such as in a web browser. Or in a web server, it might be your request handling. But meanwhile, like I said, there are other hidden exceptions here already too. For example, say I made a bug down here in my reverse in place function. If I run this now, I'm getting an index out of bounds exception because of the bug in this code. And this is entirely preventable if I just don't write this bug. And swap is declared to throw index out of bounds exception in such cases, though not in the throws way, but just in the Java doc way. And if every kind of indexing had to declare the kind of error that could happen, I could have a whole bunch more declared exceptions everywhere. But the expectation is that if I don't write bugs, it's not going to happen. So it's okay if these are invisible. Now, what I wouldn't want to see happen is up here. Let's format that and get this index out of bounds exception and catch that. Aha, run it. Aha, still alive. I'm gonna argue this is something you shouldn't ever do because nothing here either documented or declared this possible error type. So I'm relying on undocumented behavior of the system and therefore likely to have this be brittle for future behavior. This is not statically known to happen. It just dynamically could happen by sheer coincidence. Another place we could have such things happen is in our decoding of code points. Unicode doesn't actually go this high. So if I run this program, 
we get an exception telling me that it's illegal. And if I look inside of here, we can see where it says that we can get an illegal argument exception for a bad code point. That again was documented on the string constructor, but I did not document it on my codes to string. Now, should that be a runtime exception? If I'm processing data I don't control, then maybe I don't know if such a thing could happen and I want to make it more obvious. If I do control the data, however, then it's my fault if bad code points go through. But I guess I just thought it would be too annoying to have checked exceptions here in this case. And speaking of people finding checked exceptions annoying, when we move to C Sharp, we find that there are no such thing as checked exceptions. And the only way to declare your exceptions is to put it in the documentation. And depending on how careful I've been and what my design is, I may or may not want to tell people up higher level what kinds of exceptions can happen lower down. And I still can recover from any kind of undeclared situation in C Sharp, just like I can in Java. And the map operation here called select doesn't really care whether there are declared exceptions or not, because again, that's just documentation in C Sharp and not a core part of the function signature, like for checked exceptions in Java. Let's prove it works though. And we see here we've gone too far again. Our tar flow turns into rat wolf, and we do get an exception handled and move on to being still alive up in Maine. Now let's move on to a language that doesn't have exceptions, but does have explicit error values and panics, which are basically the same thing as declared exception cases, especially checked exceptions in Java, and also has undeclared or undocumented cases, which are explicitly called panics in Go. So let's do look at Golang here. We can process our text, where our text retrieval has an explicit option for returning an error. And note here in Go that we return both a value and an error, with the convention being that only one or the other should actually be set to something meaningful. So I return an error in the case the ID isn't recognized, and if that error was not nil, then we panic here, where we have not declared any error. And again, depending on the organization of your code, it may or may not be in a place where you can actually pass errors along easily up the call stack, even if in this case, it might have been wise to have that. So here, we had an explicit error from text retrieval. We're going to panic in an undeclared way, though I could put it in a comment. And so even though this isn't explicit, again, there are ways to recover from our panic. With my defer function, I can call recover and find out if there was an error that happened. Let's try it out. We see rat wolf panic, which is being printed out right here. And we're still alive back up in Maine. Notice we can panic with any kind of value and then get that value up here if we want to. And so again, my contention here is that panics are like unchecked or undocumented exceptions in Java or C Sharp and declared errors or documented exceptions in the previous languages we saw. Let's look briefly at another language that also uses error values and panics. Not the only two, but just looking at some examples. And here we have Rust, same thing as before. Retrieve text might return an error, but process text panics if retrieve failed. By the way, note down here that if my swap indices are bad, I'm going to get a panic. This is still a case where they figure it's my fault and my bug if I'm doing it wrong, and it's burdensome to have to explicitly manage errors in such cases. Go also panics on index out of bounds. And in terms of recovering from panics in Rust, we do have this catch unwind option, which turns panics back into errors again. So if I check to see if I got an error, then I can handle that down here. Where here I'm just checking if I have an explicit message as a string or some other kind of type I'm going to arbitrarily format out to a string. And up in main, we can see if we're still alive. And we are. However, you do have the option to simply abort on panic instead of unwinding the stack. And we can do that with a Rust C flag saying that panic is abort. If we run it this way, we see that we aborted and we are not still alive. And as an aside, this extra bother here is just to prevent the default message that happens anytime you panic. So in this case, I get this extra thread panicked at a certain line number. And in your panic cook, you can actually do anything you want there. My default here was just do nothing, so I don't get that message. Again, put this back, and that message no longer happens.
But in terms of this abort option, let's take a look at C. There's a lot of ways you might try to do things in C because there isn't really any uniform standard of how to do stuff. You can long jump, you can find third-party libraries to help you unwind stack, or there might be other options as well. In this case, I'm actually going to use the abort signal, the same one that crashed us in Rust. Only in this case, I'm going to actually put in a signal handler so it doesn't fully totally crash us immediately. So for my retrieve text function, I have an explicit error enum, where zero is okay and any non-zero value is some kind of error. This is one of many possible conventions people use for explicitly talking about error states in C. And if I'm returning an enum error, I have to get my actual results somewhere else. So I put an extra layer of pointer indirection on it so that I can receive the value here and still check for an error there. And for my process text function, maybe I could have said a null pointer means it's also error, but I'm gonna go with, if I don't explicitly return error, that means you should rely on it. That's my pretend convention for this program. So I'm going to assert that I don't have an error. And up here in main, I call run and see if I'm still alive. And run registers a signal handler to run custom code if there's an error. Let's try it. And we see rat wolf assert message run aborted, aborted core dumped, just like we saw up here in Rust. Because when the abort signal is caught, you can react to it, but when your function ends, the program also does. So if I want to keep going, I can't let my program end. In this case, instead of using a simple main, I'm going to have a state machine main where I could possibly even have a global variable to track my state such that I can always pick up where I left off. Now if I run it, after I do my run, I handle the abort and I pick back up in my pseudo main at still alive. Whether this is a good idea or not, I don't know. And in any case, the OS still sees the abort signal and reports that error when the program's over. And finally, if I call abort directly instead of using assert, I don't get the automatic message, which I may or may not want in different situations. But in any case, assert slash abort is one of the common ways to express panic in C code. And a lot of these other languages have assert behavior as well, which might throw an error in Java or panic in Rust or other such things. Meanwhile, we've had a lot of fun, but let's have a little bit more before we're done. Let's try out Gleam. Gleam is fun. Just like Rust, you might return a value or an error, or you might not express failability, in which case you might choose to panic. And panic is supposed to crash your code in Gleam. But let's see what we can do about that. Let's run this. Gleam either compiles to Erlang or JavaScript. Let's try Erlang first. We've seen a panic here from going to an undefined document with ID 3. This panic actually happened, but we recovered even though you're not supposed to be able to in Gleam. And I'm sure Louie would say I'm being very bad here, but how I've made this recover work is with external functions. And let's prove JavaScript is working as well here. And I lost my history a bit, so let's run this one again. And we see that we recover from the panic. Let's do this also in JavaScript now. We can also handle it in JavaScript. And how, again, we do this is with an external function. Because I can run functions in Erlang, which does have try-catch, or JavaScript, which also has try-catch. So I can pass in two functions, which is the recover function. And in the case of this use syntax, it means everything after it is also passed in as a second function. So we have the first function, which happens on error. And the second function is your main code. Same thing in JavaScript. The first function is your error handler. The second one is your main thing, which allows me to make this Gleam code look a lot like the Go code, even though the mechanics of what's happening here is very different. So meanwhile, we saw a variety of languages here and got to see how they express explicit errors that have been documented or declared versus implicit errors for times you can't declare an error or when you don't want to because it should be a state you never entered in the first place, and the exact usage of which has some different expectations across the different languages as well. So I hope this has been fun, 
and I could say bye y'all, but I want to mention quickly that this whole code points thing is a bit odd and just plain old string reversal in Gleam actually reverses on grapheme clusters instead of code points. So I've gone to extra effort to do a worse job here, but all that's going to be better on a different day maybe. So if you want to see either that or who knows what I might do next in the future, make sure to subscribe. Bye y'all.